Uh, welcome everyone to our uh, November monthly program. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Brian Zaint. I'm the Executive Director for Piltruck Audubon. Uh, a few quick announcements before we get to our presentation. Uh, this coming Thursday, uh, November 16th, um, I'll be giving a program at the Everett Public Library um, along with um, the Washington Native Plant Society um, about uh, native plants for wildlife. Um, free program, it'll be at the, the main Everett Library, downtown Everett. So um, feel free to uh, join us for that. I'll put the, the information for that in the chat here in a little bit. Um, next Saturday, so November 18th, uh, we, are do, we have a native plant giveaway at the Wildlife Habitat and Native Demon Plant Wildlife Habitat and Native Plant Demonstration Garden in Edmonds. Um, that's located near the Edmonds Marsh. Um, feel free to come and get some free native plants. Um, uh, yeah, no, no uh, obligations other than that. Uh, and then December 16th, we have the Edmonds Christmas Bird Count. Um, I'm the compiler for that one. So if you'd like to participate, uh, feel free to get in touch with me and I'll get you signed up. And January 1st, we have the Everett Marysville Christmas Bird Count. And Scott Atkinson is the compiler for that one. Um, and his uh, contact information is on our website if you'd like to do that one. Um, I'm also excited to announce that our updated Birding in Snohomish County book is going to print very soon, hopefully next week. So we should hopefully have those available for you before the holidays, um, make great uh, holiday gifts. Um, and we will we'll be taking pre-orders uh, very soon. So keep an eye out for those. And then I also wanna mention that um, starting in January, we will be switching our monthly programs to Thursday nights. Um, we're gonna switch from Fridays to Thursdays. And um, we will also be going back to in-person in January. We're gonna try and do a hybrid setup and see how that goes. So if you wanna attend in person in January, um, you're welcome to. Um, if you want us to still watch on Zoom, you're more than welcome to do that as well. Um, we'll provide some more details for that and how to participate and what dates and things like that. Those will be um, in the coming weeks. So um, that's all I have for announcements. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Christopher Tanra from The Ohio State University. Um, and he'll talk about the influence of salmon and the nutrients uh, that they provide on the life history of the American Dipper. So Chris, Chris. Uh, please feel free to take, a, take it away. Great, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, hold on, I'm sure my screen's set up here. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna talk today about uh, work I did uh, in Olympic National Park and other parts of the Olympic Peninsula uh, back when I, primarily when I was a fellow actually at the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center um, and finished up when I began my position here at Ohio State and um, kind of all centered around this massive effort that was the removal of the two dams on the Elwha River. Um, this picture here showing the removal of uh, the upper Glines Canyon Dam, just giving an idea of kind of the scale of what a massive effort that was. And look, using birds as somewhat of a window into looking at what what impacts this could potentially have on, on that entire ecosystem um, from by, by removing those barriers uh, along that river. So, so before I get started, I just want to acknowledge this was a, a big project that had a lot of a lot of people that contributed to it. Uh, most of all, the two uh, primary uh, uh, other uh, co-investigators I had on the project, Pete Mara, who was my advisor at the Smithsonian at the time uh, when I was a postdoc there, who's now at Georgetown University, kind of showing the real reason he wanted to get involved with uh, research in the Pacific Northwest uh, there on the left, and Kim Sager Fratkin, who uh, is with the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe, a wildlife biologist there. And it was part of a larger project that also examined the impacts of the dam removals on river otter as well. Uh, and Kim really led that effort. Um, and then I kind of focused more on the the bird side. Um, and then we had a lot of a lot of help in the field, um, both in terms of providing support, um, but also really providing um, uh, logistical support, but providing hands-on help in the field, uh, none more so than Sarah Sunde Hasarelli there on the left, um, who was uh, a field technician with me every season I was out there. 
um, and who now uh, uh, works with the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe still today. Um, so I just want to acknowledge all those people as well, because uh, running around and catching birds in those rivers is not not an easy thing. And then just to acknowledge all the people that funded this, a uh, large chunk of this was funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service through a tribal wildlife uh, research grant. And then support uh, we also received from U.S. EPA, um, State of Washington, the National Park Service, um, and the Forest Service, uh, a, a lot of support from a, a lot of different agencies. So just at the start here, I just want to acknowledge everybody uh, involved in this. And so kind of the, the real driving force behind this research was um, the impacts of dams. Um, so dams are, you know, one of the biggest ways which humans impact rivers. Um, and there's a lot of dams in the world, almost 17 million worldwide. Um, pretty much in the United States, it's estimated every watershed greater than 2,000 square kilometers is impacted by dams. And dams, of course, provide, you know, they're built for a reason. They provide a lot of important um, services to human society, including providing uh, water for the food supply in terms of irrigation for agriculture, um, and also the, the power generated by hydropower dams. Um, about 20% of the world's electricity comes from um, that source. So dams have really important societal impacts on humans in terms of our needs for water, food, and electricity. But they certainly also have really significant ecological impacts. Um, and, you know, we, we see this quite a bit in places like the Colorado River, which, you know, no longer reaches the, um, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so what was once the, the most expansive estuary in North America and one of the greatest, you know, ecosystems in, in the world really, really no longer exists because that, that estuary no longer receives water on a regular basis, as shown in the image on the left. Um, and then cert that's downstream impacts we see. Upstream, we see loss of habitat through the creation of these reservoirs, taking what was once bottomland forest or riparian forest um, and creating these standing lake ecosystems. Um, and then the impacts that it has um, on things like fish populations, which was really evident when we saw things like the massive die off of salmon in the Klamath River in 2002 due to almost no water being released from the four dams along the Klamath River in a very, very severe drought year, um, causing you know, massive death of salmon as they were spawning uh, or attempting to spawn in the Klamath. Um, so significant impacts that are a cost to these services that, that dams provide to society. And so, we see situations like this where there's all this great potential um, of things like salmon being part of an ecosystem that's completely cut off. And that's really, I love this image just as, a, as summing it all up in terms of the impacts of dams where you have these adult salmon on the Elwha River, you know, just about four or five uh, miles upstream, um, just cut off from that entire watershed which otherwise would be a very, very high quality watershed being most of it is within the Olympic National Park. Um, but at the time of this photo, that was as far as they could migrate up that water, up that river in order to spawn and limiting really any sort of positive impact they could have on that ecosystem. And so what we focused on in terms of those positive impacts. And, and one of the really interesting things that's come out of researching the impacts that salmon have on ecosystems beyond, you know, what salmon themselves provide in terms of, you know, a food resource to humans, a food resource to wildlife, um, is this idea that salmon also really act like fertilizer in freshwater ecosystems. So especially there in the Pacific Northwest, you know, the river and stream systems really tend to be very low nutrient systems. Um, there's not a lot of basic nutrients in there to provide, you know, production uh, at the bottom of the food web. So a lot of primary production of plant life or algae. Um, there's not a lot of nutrients that come in from the surrounding, uh, the, the surrounding areas deposited into those streams 
um, to to sort of feed that base of the ecosystem and then support um, a lot of life higher up in the food web. Um, but what you do have in the Pacific Northwest is these fish that are born in these freshwater systems migrate out to the ocean where they gain more than 80% of their body mass in this really nutrient rich ocean food web and then return to the river, die and essentially fertilize the river. So it's one way that those rivers in the Pacific Northwest can receive a lot of nutrients to support that, that primary productivity, that growth at the base of the food web um, to then have a more vibrant ecosystem, a more vibrant, diverse food web, um, salmon can provide that. Um, so they they can provide that directly through organisms consuming adults or consuming fry or consuming eggs, um, but also through their decomposition, through the carcasses decomposing in the rivers like this uh, decomposing carcass on the on the right there, at the mouth of Griff Creek, uh, tributary to the Elwha River, um, and and can act in that way to also positively impact the ecosystem. <clears throat> so there's been there are a number of research studies that have been done looking at these impacts. So it's been found, for instance, in aquatic invertebrates that you get more abundant and more diverse aquatic invertebrate communities like this stonefly larvae here when there are salmon present. So they have this positive effect on that part of the food web. They also positively impact themselves. So it's actually been found for salmon fry, they can get upwards of 30% or even more of their protein from their parents. So either by directly consuming the decomposing carcasses of their parents or through this fertilization effect. So the nitrogen that they're is decomposed from their parents that then feeds into the bottom of the food web and feeds aquatic invertebrates that then they consume. Um, and then there's been some really interesting studies looking at terrestrial animals like bear and how bear are, um, they have greater productivity, um, they have earlier breeding, they it impacts when they move and how much they move uh, the, the, the fact of whether or not there are salmon present. Um, so salmon as a resource has this huge impact on bear. And so this is where we get concerned about when you have a dam, like the dams that used to be on the Elwha, cutting off that resource, then you lose these positive benefits that, that are seen here. And it's been recognized for a while that there is value of songbirds. Um, in monitoring the impacts of marine derived nutrients. Um, and so it's just been documented purely that songbirds like this winter wren or now Pacific wren um, actually do, you can use tracers, which I'll talk about in a minute to show that they, they are receiving these marine derived nutrients, nitrogen and other um, molecules that they have in their bodies actually originate in the ocean. Um, and so that that resource is not only impacting the stream, but it's crossing out of the stream into that terrestrial ecosystem and those surrounding forests uh, to reach these birds. And there had been some research, uh, this graph shown on the right there, just looking at how the presence of salmon impacts the, the density. So how many individuals per acre of these different songbird species, um, we can see positive impacts in like the winter wren, the, 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 the bars on the left there, you just have a, a more dense winter wren population below waterfalls where there are salmon than you do where there are not salmon. Um, so th this is a good indicator that there are positive effects of marine derived nutrients um, on, on these, uh, organisms, but we are always very cautious when we look at these sort of population level metrics um, because they can be somewhat misleading due to things like behavioral dominance. Um, there's actually a famous paper that was written back in 1983 by a, an ecologist named Beatrice Van Horn 
um, which was titled density can be a misleading leading indicator of habitat quality. Um, essentially that we really need to know what's going on with individuals and how individuals are impacted to see if it's really truly scaling up to be a positive effect. Um, so it's a good indicator that, yeah, there's probably some positive effects there, but we really need to take a closer look and see, you know, whether or not birds are receiving these benefits of uh, marine derived nutrients is, is that really, really impacting birds or any organisms at, at an individual level such that populations are going to really positively respond. So we designed this study to use a really charismatic and, and um, very ideal bird for examining the impacts of salmon on ecosystems, the American Dipper, um, which exists right at the interface of the aquatic and terrestrial um, ecosystems to ask a couple of questions and address these two objectives. So one, we wanted to know at the individual level for these birds, what's the impact that barriers to salmon and ultimately the nutrients that they carry in from the ocean, what's the impact they have on, on individuals? Um, and then we also looked, wanted to know, since we were doing this research right around the time of the dam removals on the Elwha River, um, what's how soon after you remove dams do you see some of those nutrients return? Um, so how, if one, is there a difference for birds above and below barriers of, of these nutrients? And then how quickly do we get a response once we remove a dam? Um, and so I'll, I'll address, I'll, I'll talk about the research on that first question first, and then, and then the second question, I'll, I'll wrap up with that. So the star of the show is the American Dipper. Um, otherwise known as the water oozel, um, a bird you are extremely lucky to have in your state. Um, and I really wish we had something even close to it in the in in Ohio. Um, we have the Louisiana water thrush is as close as we get, which which is a great bird, um, but it's but it's hard to compare to dippers. Um, so dippers, if you're not very familiar with them, they're really a top consumer in the aquatic food web and in, in terms of they, they will eat almost anything they can fit in their mouth underwater. Um, so they, they forage by swimming, by walking on the, the, the bed of, of rivers and streams, um, primarily eating aquatic invertebrates, but they will also eat small fish. They will eat tadpoles. They will eat um, fish eggs, um, kind of any resource that, that's big enough for them to consume. Um, one important story for the, for, for the research today, too, important aspect of their ecology is they're what we call a partial migrant. And partial migrants are migratory birds that some individuals migrate every year and other individuals don't migrate at all. And so you're, you're one or the other in the population. And we're not talking about migration like neotropical migrants here migrating to different latitudes. Some dippers are elevational migrants. So they will breed at high elevation in streams. And in the winter, they will migrate down to lower elevations to spend the winter. So some individuals will do that. Some individuals will stay in one place all throughout the winter. Um, and so just, just keep that in mind as I'll, I'll bring that up again. And dippers, because they are so tied to aquatic food webs. And we know that, you know, aquatic invertebrates are very sensitive to environmental impacts. Um, you know, whether those be natural or human caused, one of the best ways to know if a stream is healthy is to look at its, its population of mayflies and caddisfly larvae and all these other aquatic invertebrates. So since dippers are really dependent on those as a food resource, if you see a healthy dipper population in a stream, it's usually a good indication that it's a good, healthy stream. Um, so they, they've they been researched in this way, not only in North America, but their cousins in Europe have, have been the subject of a lot of classic studies just showing how 
one of the easiest, quickest ways to monitor the health of streams at a large scale is just to monitor the dipper population um, because they're they're so sensitive to the the uh, healthy food web within that the, that aquatic space. So um, hopefully this bar isn't blocking everything here. I can't uh, make it go away. Um, but um, so dippers, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you have spent a good amount of time watching dippers. So you're, you're familiar um, with their habits. You know, they, they get the name dipper because they dip into the water and they dip as they bob up and down on their legs. Um, and then they, they forage by swimming, diving, walking in the water. So this is just kind of classic dipper behavior here. So they have a nictitating membrane, so a, a clear eyelid essentially under their main eyelid. So they can close that and be able to see under the water. So when that bird's diving under the water, it's visually searching for prey. Um, they also have incredibly cute babies. Um, so this is a couple, you know, a day or two out of the nest, uh, fledglings on the sole. So I love that as soon as they're out of the nest, they're doing that that bobbing deep knee bend behavior. Um, <clears throat> they're also famous for, for being John Muir's favorite bird. Um, I love this quote by him um, ab about dippers from the mountains of California. Um, so very, in addition to being really important in terms of environmental monitoring, they, they, they have a very um, important place uh, just, just as, as an endearing, you know, really charismatic species of the rivers of the West. Um, so we studied dippers across much of the Northern uh, uh, Olympic Peninsula. So we had 62 territories that we worked with from 2011 to 2014. Uh, so this is showing just these, each of these dots is a dipper territory. Um, the dots that are circles for the work I'm gonna be talking about here, all of which, the first half of this all took place before either of the dams had been removed um, or it was more while the lower Elwha dam was being removed. But the two dams on the Elwha are these dotted lines. All the dots that are circles are dipper territories that did not have any access to salmon. So they're all above either natural barriers, like on the Solduck River here, that's the Solduck Falls up by the hot springs, if you've been there before. Um, so all that those falls are impassable to salmon. Also on Barnes Creek above Lake Crescent, um, no salmon are able to get past the barrier here where there's a waterfall. So there's no salmon um, up Barnes Creek, um, the Elwha River, of course, behind the dams. And then we also worked along Dungeon, the Dungeness River, um, which all of those territories um, were accessible to salmon. Um, so the idea here was we monitored these territories, we captured individuals to look at what indicators of what they were eating and what kind of nutrients they were getting. And then we found nests and monitored their productivity. Um, and so finding dipper nests was one of my favorite parts of this project because they really nest in some interesting places. Um, probably if you've seen a dipper nest before, it was on a bridge. Um, like these nests, this is actually the same territory, but two different years. So the, the nest on the left is the old nest. And then the active nest is the one on the right at the same territory. Um, so the nests are these sort of living nests um, built out of live green moss. And they're generally kept moist because they're built in places that are receiving a lot of, you know, spray from the river itself, they tend to nest over really deep water, deep, fast moving water, which probably avoids them being exposed to terrestrial predators. 
Um, and bridges really provide, you know, an inaccessible spot right above fast moving deep water. Um, so if you drive, you know, out the Olympic Peninsula and you're you're crossing the Solduck multiple times, every one of those bridges crossing the Solduck, it's got a dipper nest on it. Um, they they really have taken to bridges like this is one um, over the Dungeness River. Um, but really what I love finding was the natural nests. So a lot of this work took place inside the national park. Um, so it had an opportunity to really see, you know, before there were any bridges, what kind of places were they building their nests? And we found a lot of really cool ones. So I'll, I'll show this picture for a minute. See if you can, if you think you can find the nest in this picture. So this is essentially me looking straight at a fallen dug fir. Um, that's still covered in a lot of moss. This is up above the Solduck Falls on the Solduck River. So there actually is a nest in that photo. It's right there. Um, so that hump of green is actually the built nest with the living green moss. And that dark area there is the entrance to the nest over this deep, swift portion of the river. Um, this was really one of my favorite nests. And I'm really sad because I went back to a lot of these sites um, just this past, well, about a year ago, <clears throat> and this tree is no longer there. Um, but the, this is the roots of a really huge, massive uh, dug fir right on the edge of the Solduck River, right where the north and south forks come together. Um, and Dippers just really love confluences like that because there's generally a lot of a lot of diversity of of uh, or a lot of productivity in those sites, so a lot of a lot of bugs for them to eat. Um, but I don't know if you see uh, right here, that's the dipper on a rock, and I just kept seeing them go straight up into this root ball. Um, so this was a terrifying nest to check. So it was right up there inside that root mass. Um, so I had to get under this tree. And I mean, the trunk of the tree is right here. I'm not surprised the tree has gone now because just from the river undercutting that root system, it finally just fell in the river. Um, so this site's no longer there, but just getting under that tree, trying to look up in there, seeing what was going on in that nest was was pretty terrifying. And then these are probably my two favorite nests that we found. Um, so if you have been up the Solduck in the Olympic National Park, um, you, you'll, you'll probably recognize this location, but you'll just see this individual, this bird is building the nest at this point. Um, and then the, the video will pan out and you'll see uh, what the location was. So that is the Solduck Falls, the, the three-parted waterfall. So that's the barrier for salmon there. And this bird actually, we had to exclude from all the, the, the research I'm about to show because they had they were both accessing areas with no salmon and accessing areas below the falls with salmon. So they were kind of right at that cutoff, um, but really a nice inaccessible spot um, to be. And then this last one, I spent so much time trying to find this nest. It's up way up a tiny tributary of Barnes Creek, um, which feeds into Lake Crescent. And I, I was going up and up and up following this bird up this tributary and it just kept disappearing on me. It was raining out. And I just remember collapsing on a log and finally seeing where this bird was going. And I, I like to call this one the bat cave nest. So it's bringing in a mouthful of aquatic invertebrates here going in to feed the chick just behind that little cascade. It's like uh, the entrance to the bat cave. So really, really fun birds to find their nests. And so we would find their nests and then follow them throughout the season. Uh, we did some work looking at what kind of food they were bringing in, um, doing some behavioral observations. But the main thing was looking at how how productive they were and how many broods they attempted to to produce in a year. So we also wanted to get some really detailed information on 
what they were eating and and really what nutrients they were receiving. So we want to know, you know, what kind of impact those marine nutrients that salmon are bringing in, what kind of impact they're having. Um, we need to capture the birds so we can take samples from them that'll tell us what kinds of things they're they're eating. And not only, you know, we can look at what they're eating, but those things they're eating, are they receiving those nutrients from salmon or not? And then look at, okay, if they are receiving those nutrients, what sort of impacts are they having? Um, so to catch dippers, the, you know, we use mist nets, which if you've ever seen bird banding operations, um, this is what we generally use to catch a lot of different types of birds, especially songbirds. So you'll see these two painter's poles here. In between them is a fine nylon mesh net. Um, you'll get a better look at it in a second. Um, and dippers, the nice thing about them in terms of catching them is dippers really, really hate the idea of flying over land. Um, you very rarely see a dipper you know, point A to point B on the river could be a very short flight if they just flew over a little peninsula of land, but they will just follow the stream and meander around along with it. The only time you really see them fly over land is when they're being chased by a predator or something like a, you know, an occipiter hawk or something like that. Um, so that makes it really handy for catching them because in a situation like this, this is on Griff Creek. Um, right near um, the, the ranger station on the lower Elwha River. So if you can get a net all the way across, we can just stretch it right across the stream. And sooner or later, that bird's going to come up or down stream and we'll fly into that net and we can extract it out. Um, and then this is just me extracting a dipper from the net. So you can kind of see there, there's these lines that go across called trammels that create pockets. So the bird flies into the into the net falls in that pocket and then I run out and, and can extract it. Um, and generally with dippers, since we're catching birds over water, we just have one net or two nets set up that we can watch at all times, um, just so that as soon as that bird hits the net, we can run over to it and get it out because um, we don't want a bird caught in the net and falling in the water or something like that. Um, but it can get challenging. Um, you know, some of those rivers get pretty deep. This is about as deep as I would go in that swift water. Once that water's over your knees, um, you can get swept away pretty quickly. Um, but you get into some hairy situations trying to get a net all the way across the, the streams. Um, sometimes you just have to set up on a section of the stream. And even sometimes I would stand off the end of the net waving a stick or something. So the bird wouldn't want to go that way and would go the other way into the net if I couldn't get the net all the way across. Um, sometimes the water was just way too deep, like here on the Dungeness, and we would try dangling nets uh, from, from a bridge. Um, but sometimes we could access the nest also. Um, so this is uh, a big old dug fir, uh, or actually uh, dug fir cedar, I can't remember. Um, and so the... Uh, this was a hollowed out log out over the Solduck River. Bird was nesting inside that log. And so we could get a dip net, wait for the female to go in and then put that net over the nest. She flushes off the nest into the, into the dip net and then we were able to band her. So used a lot of different techniques, tried to get creative in a lot of different ways uh, to catch these birds. And, and we're pretty successful. We were able to get a lot of samples both of birds with with and without um, salmon present. Okay, so I don't want to scare you, making you think back to chemistry class, um, but I do have to talk about the, the methods we use to look at those marine-derived nutrients. And, and we used a technique called stable isotope, using stable isotopes. Um, so isotopes are, you know, we have atoms of different elements and generally there's, there's the common form of an element, like for hydrogen on the left, we have you know the, the common hydrogen atom. So 95% of the hydrogen in the world is one proton in the nucleus with one electron orbiting it. But there is a smaller amount of the hydrogen in the world that's what we call deuterium or hydrogen two. And it's called hydrogen two because it has a mass of two because it has an extra particle in the nucleus, a neutron. Um, so it still acts like hydrogen, 
but it's a little bit heavier. Um, and this is true of a lot of elements. And these are these are stable isotopes. So unlike radioisotopes or like radioactive uh, isotopes that decay over time and lose mass, these don't decay. They stay stable. And we look at the ratio of these in the environment because how much of normal hydrogen versus deuterium you have in a site is kind of predictable in different geographies or due to things like um, how much protein is in the diet. So that happens with nitrogen. So animals that have more protein in the diet tend to have the a lot more of the heavier form of nitrogen like in their tissues, like in their blood and in their, their skin or feathers or whatever it might be. Um, so we use that knowledge of how the amount of the, the common type of an element to the heavier types of an element, how that varies in different individuals can tell us about what those individuals have been eating or where they've been. Um, and so we use that in a lot of different ways in ecology. Um, and specifically here, we used it to look at how much um, of the marine nutrients were dippers getting in their diet in these different areas. So when we think about marine derived nutrients and stable isotopes, there's, there's a couple of different ways we think it can be, or we know it can be used to measure their impact. So birds could get directly enriched by marine derived nutrients. And what that means is their salmon are bringing in these nutrients and birds are consuming those nutrients directly from the salmon. So this could happen if say they were feeding on a decaying carcass um, or, you know, in bear or something like that, they're feeding on, you know, live salmon adults, or you're feeding on tissues they're directly producing like eggs. So that would be another way you're just directly consuming these nutrients or you're consuming an organism that directly consumed it. So, you know, a stonefly larvae was eating a salmon carcass and then a dipper ate that stonefly larvae. That would be another direct way they could be consuming it. And so when that happens, we would expect a lot of heavy nitrogen and a lot of heavy carbon. And so carbon and nitrogen as elements are really good signatures of marine influence, influence from the ocean. And this is because in the ocean, the heavy isotopes, so just think high numbers, uh, if it's easier to think of it that way, high numbers for nitrogen isotopes or high numbers for carbon, we expect those in the ocean. Nitrogen, because nitrogen gets high because of protein. There's a lot of nitrogen and protein. So if you're feeding high in the food web, a high protein diet, you have high nitrogen values. Well, food chains in the ocean are very long. And so nitrogen gets really concentrated if you're like a salmon, a big salmon in the ocean feeding pretty high up in the food chain. Carbon is different in the ocean than it is in the terrestrial. And that's, that's because the carbon in the ocean that enters food webs comes from calcium carbonate in the ocean. Whereas in terrestrial ecosystems, it's coming from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So just because of that difference, carbon numbers are much higher in the ocean than they are in terrestrial food webs. So if dippers are directly consuming nutrients, we expect both those numbers to be really high. Um, but they can also indirectly get nutrients. And that's that fertilizer effect. So if the way they're getting nutrients is the salmon decomposes and then the nitrogen from that, that decomposed out of the salmon, you know, just like you would put cow manure on your garden, that is putting nitrogen out there that, and then enriching the soil, which then plants use, and then invertebrates consume those plants, birds consume those invertebrates and so on. So salmon can act in the same way. The primary producers here more being like algaes and biofilms and other things like that and a stream, but the same concept of they're using those nutrients from the decomposed salmon. And then the invertebrates are eating those, you know, a lot of the invertebrates are eating those biofilms and those algaes and things. 
and then the birds are eating those invertebrates. So this, this is more of an indirect way that the nutrients can get to the dippers. If that's the case, carbon doesn't work in that cycle. It doesn't really pass through in that way. Nitrogen does. I mean, that's like you're putting the cow manure on the garden for the nitrogen. Same thing here. So if birds are receiving an indirect enrichment, if they're having an, an impact from the fertilizer effect, you might call it, we only expect nitrogen to have high numbers. Um, so just, just to kind of give you some, some idea of what we expect to see if birds are benefiting from marine derived nutrients. Um, it One of these patterns and which pattern we see tells us a little bit about, you know, or it, how, which way those nutrients are getting to the birds. So this is what the results look like. So we took blood samples. This is just a, an image of how we take the blood sample. There's a really, there's a vein that kind of drains all the blood from the wing. So we poke a small hole in that vein and take just like a capillary tube of blood. And then that looking at that gives us an idea of what that bird's been eating recently by looking at those stable isotopes in the blood. And so the figure on the left here is the patterns we found across those years of the study. So again, high nitrogen means more enrichment, more marine nutrients, high carbon, the same thing. The triangles are sites where salmon were present. The circles are sites where salmon were not present. And what you can see is a pretty strong pattern. Don't worry about the statistics there. You can see it for yourself. Much higher nitrogen, much higher carbon when salmon were present. So this just tells us that indeed, it's a very strong indication that dippers are receiving marine nutrients. Um, uh, definitely they're receiving it through that direct pathway. They could also be receiving it through the indirect pathway, but you know, since we have both high, you know, they're definitely getting it from feeding on invertebrates that have been feeding on salmon or feeding on salmon tissues themselves like eggs or, or carcasses. So then we wanted to look at, well, what impact does that have on the dippers? Um, so this is what's called a scaled mass index. You can essentially think of this like a BMI, you get a body mass index you get when you go to the doctor. It's taking their body mass, how much they weigh, but then correcting it for the effect of the body size. Um, so it's scaling it. So we're, we're just looking at their energetic condition, essentially. And so you can see there the, the salmon colored bars are birds in areas with salmon. The gray bars are birds in areas without salmon. And so we didn't find any difference in males. And this is, I, I should say, all during the breeding season. So this is while they're nesting. Um, so no impact on males, but a big impact on females. Females in areas with salmon were in much better energetic condition than they were in areas without salmon. And this isn't surprising. We see this difference between males and females a lot in studies during the breeding season because females really have the greatest energetic cost. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have the greatest energetic cost in breeding because they're the ones that are producing the eggs, which is very energetically expensive. They also, you know, males kind of vary in how much they contribute to parental care and to nest building. Male dippers do both. Um, but, you know, not every male is the same, but females all have to contribute a lot. So generally we expect greater energetic expenditure by females in the breeding season. And this is just showing that females are much better off if they're in those areas uh, where salmon are present and they're receiving those, those marine derived nutrients. So then we want to know, well, what, what's the impact of that then on their productivity? So how many productivity, meaning how many offspring do they produce in a given year? And there's been previous studies, uh, one from uh, British Columbia uh, that looked at this behavior of double brooding in dippers. And double brooding is just when a bird fledges a nest in a breeding season and then attempts to fledge a second brood. So essentially tries to double the number of young they produce in a year. 
dippers will do this, but they don't always do it. And that study found that, you know, double brooding was the biggest driver for dippers in how many young they produce over the course of their lifetime. It has a big impact on that. And what we found is dippers in areas where salmon were present were 20 times more likely to attempt to fledge a second brood. If they were in areas without salmon, they generally didn't even try to get off that second brood, but birds were way more likely in areas where the salmon were present, um, probably because they they have more resources available and more than richer resources. So then we also wanted to look at the young themselves. And what we looked at here was the the size of the young that they produced. Um, so we use the DNA from blood samples to tell which offspring were males and which were females. And then we looked at how big they were. Um, so tarsus is the, the long bone. So th this bone where the bands are here. Um, that long bone is a good indicator of how big an individual is. And what you see here is, again, no effect in males, but in female offspring, they were much larger in areas with salmon than they were in areas without, without salmon. Um, and body size can be important for things like thermoregulation, for things like competition, behavioral dominance. Um, and as far as why you know, females might have an impact and not males, this could be because in dippers, they're, they're what we call size dimorphic. Females are smaller than males. And so in the nest, generally females have to compete with larger male siblings for receiving food that the adults are bringing in. And so it could be that, you know, being a larger female in an area with salmon, you, you can compete with your siblings better, um, but you have more trouble doing that where there's more competition for less food potentially um, in areas without salmon. And we were able to look at the isotopes and it does look like, you know, body size was really predicted by how high the carbon was. Um, so, you know, indicating that there was a real impact of those marine nutrients here. Marine, the amount of marine nutrients an individual receiving was having an effect on how big it ultimately grew to be in the nest. So again, I, I mentioned that dippers are, are partial migrants. So some individuals migrate, some don't. And previous research has also shown, you know, generally migrants don't have as good lifetime reproductive success, don't produce as many young over the course of their lifetime as, um, as birds that stay in the same place all year round. And what we found was Birds in areas with salmon tended to stay there all year round. Birds that were breeding in areas without salmon, they tended to leave in the winter and migrate somewhere else to spend the winter. So they were 13 times more likely to stay put if they were breeding in an area with salmon. Um, so that's just telling you that, you know, salmon are, are, are you know, uh, our predictor of the more advantageous life history of being a resident bird, generally the better the better scenario for an individual, they were more likely to be able to do that if they were in an area with salmon. And then uh, we also wanted to see how well do the adults survive? Um, so you've noticed in some of the photos, all the birds received a band issued by the U.S. Geological Survey, the Bird Banding Lab. And then we put these colored bands on their legs and they're in, we read these bands in a specific order. So this bird is green, aluminum, red, red. Um, so that way we don't have to catch that bird again to know that it's still alive and to see where it is. We can go out with spotting scopes. So this is Sarah with binoculars and a spotting scope uh, up in Geyser Valley on the Elwha. And you can just see this individual, read those bands on the leg and say, okay, that bird's still alive. And so we did surveys all around every year um, to look for birds 
that were present. This is also how we measured that migratory behavior. We surveyed the territories in the non-breeding season in the fall to see if they were still present. And then we surveyed them every breeding season to see if they were there on their breeding territory. And we estimated what's the probability of survival. It's this analysis called mark recapture, mark reciting analysis. And essentially the take home is not a huge difference, um, but about a 5% greater likelihood of surviving the the year if you were in an if you bred in an area with salmon. So birds breeding in areas with salmon had had greater survival or less of a chance of dying. Um, and that could also be related to that migratory behavior um, as well. Okay, let me take a breath here and then we'll get into the second half. So as I mentioned, you know, dams have these benefits to human society, but they also have these negative impacts on ecosystems as well. So as a result, um, there has been a push to move a lot of dams and there's been over a thousand dams removed. Um, th this number might be a little bit old. Um, you can see how much that increased um, across the 20th century into the 21st century. There's really been a big jump in the number of dams being removed in the U.S. A lot of these have happened in places like here in Ohio, and they're what, what we call low head dams. Um, so, you know, really kind of small dams can be on relatively large rivers, um, but not the big, huge like hydropower or a very large reservoir creating dams. Um, a lot of them are put in for flood control or other reasons. Um, and many have been removed, not only because of the ecological impacts, but also because they're old and failing and unsafe for communities. Um, so they've been taken out. Um, but of course, the biggest dam removal that's happened to date, um, it's it's gonna get surpassed when they, when they do the, the Klamath River in Oregon, California. Um, but to date, the two dams removed on the Elwha River are the largest dam removal ever, ever completed in the world. Um, so these two dams, the Elwha Dam and the Glines Canyon Dam, um, were built over a century ago. They cut off 90% of this otherwise relatively pristine watershed um, cut off to salmon for potential spawning habitat. Um, they really weren't contributing much in terms of hydropower anymore. Um, so the Elwha Dam was completely removed by 2012. Um, the Glines Canyon Dam, was re the removal was completed later. Um, but we completed the study I'm presenting. When we completed that, the Glines Canyon Dam was still, um, was still obstructing any salmon moving higher up in the watershed. Um, so this is just looking closer. Again, these are all the dipper territories. This is just looking at the Elwha River. And so the rest of what I'll talk about today is, is primarily just the Elwha. Um, so there were two territories that were never obstructed from Stammen, um, down below the Elwha Dam. We have these territories in between the dams that during the period of our study, started, you know, they, they, we, we studied them both before and after the Elwha Dam was removed. And then we have these boxes here, the bird, the birds higher up the Elwha above Glines Canyon. So during the period of our study, the, that, that dam was still present the entire time. So they, they, they didn't experience any change for the entire period of the study. They were completely cut off from salmon. And so that was one of the main benefits of removing the dam were the salmon. So you could have these set potentially seven different species of salmon spawning throughout that watershed to different extents. Um, and it's really, you know, the removal of the Elwha dam being there for that and seeing that immediate response of starting to see steelhead, you know, migrating above the Elwha dam almost immediately and spawning is probably one of the greatest things I've seen in you know my career as an ecologist. Um, it, it's really, really amazing. You know, just just take that dam out and the fish will do the work, do the work. Um, and they got to work almost immediately. So it was an opportunity for us, given what we had learned about 
the impact that the nutrients they bring in could have on dippers and presumably on other parts of the ecosystem using dippers as an indicator. Um, it was a real opportunity to see, well, now the salmon are back. Do we see any response, you know, or do we see any indication that the dippers are, are receiving that benefit already? Um, so like I said, during the period of the study, this is the Elwha dam before and after removal. Um, so once that dam was out, you know, the, the Elwha tribe and they were monitoring the fish coming up. They had tagged a lot of fish. They were catching fish below the dam and trucking them up above it to get them to some of the tributary streams. Um, so when they went out to sample to see how many they tagged all those fish, they went out to sample following doing a lot of those efforts to see how many tagged fish were still there. And they just started catching a whole bunch of untagged fish, meaning they didn't really need to truck all those fish up above the dam during the removal or, or right after the removal, the fish immediately started moving past it. They were, they were ready. They'd been ready for a century. Um, and as soon as they were given the opportunity, um, they started passing that, that dam. Um, so what we could do with the dippers, since we had been sampling them before the removal and then during and after the removal, we sampled different tissues on the bird and the different tissues grow at different rates. So we could use when we sampled birds to get a time series of the stable isotopes to see how they changed. But even within one bird, what's kind of neat is we sampled multiple feathers. So they, they, we could get actually like three points in time from each bird. So we sample blood. So blood is replaced about every one to three weeks. So it gives us an idea of how many nutrients they're getting at that time scale. We also would clip toenails. And so the toenails, the tip of a toenail, it's about one to two months before that's replaced. So that gives us another time point further in the past. And then we take a feather and the feather if we're sampling it in the breeding season, they molt their feathers in about August, July and August. So that gives us an idea of what that bird was eating all the way back nine months previous. So using these turnover rates from every bird we sampled in the breeding season, we could get three points in time of how much resources it was getting. Um, and I won't go into this, but there, there's some physiological things you have to control for when you do this in terms of, of uh, uh, sampling the feathers. If you're really interested in that technicality, I, I can I can respond to it in the questions. But this is what we found. So just to, I'll show a couple of these graphs. So just to orient you. So this is just all of 2010, meaning the whole year. Um, and then these BRNB, this is 2011 breeding season. 11 non-breeding, 12 breeding, 12 non-breeding, and so on. Um, so what you're looking at here on the left, these are all birds or tissues grown prior to the dam removal. And the middle Elwha, the salmon colored bars, so those are those birds in between the dams. So they're the ones that we sampled them prior to the Elwha dam being removed and after. Um, the Birds in gray are the birds above the Glines Canyon Dam. So they're the birds that there was no change in their access to salmon during our study. They were always cut off from salmon. And then this dotted line is the, the, lo the long-term average for birds that were always had access to salmon. So those are the birds below the Elwha Dam. And that's, that's dotted line just showing right about where they were. And so this is looking at nitrogen. So you can see all those birds before the dams were removed, the birds above the dams had much lower nitrogen, not receiving marine nutrients than those birds that, that were below both dams. So then the dam is removed uh, between 2011, 2012, the salmon start spawning again. And this is what we see. So within a year, of the dam being removed, the nitrogen in the birds in that middle section was more similar to the birds that had never been cut off from salmon than it was to the birds that were still cut off up above Glines Canyon. So they immediately started accessing those nutrients. Um, that's just was incredible to me. Like they, 
not only were the salmon ready to immediately take advantage of the new spawning habitat available to them, the dippers were immediately taking advantage of the salmon being present. Um, they were already receiving all of those nutrients right away. Um, so that the impact was almost immediate. Um, we could actually do this equation, knowing a certain number of things, knowing like the nitrogen values in salmon and what we know about nitrogen values in different birds. And we can essentially calculate what percentage of the nitrogen in a dipper is coming from the ocean. That's what this equation, you know, don't worry about the terms and everything, but that's essentially what this equation is meant to estimate. <clears throat> and so what we find is on average, the birds in that middle Elwha section following the removal, you know, within a year of the removal, about 10% of their night, the nitrogen they were consuming was coming from ocean sources. Some of them were as high as 36% of their nitrogen was nitrogen from the ocean. So that's really incredible. It's actually kind of similar. That high number is kind of similar to a study that was a famous study that was done in Alaska on alder trees that found that in streams with salmon, about 30% of the nitrogen and alder trees along those streams comes from the ocean. Um, so similar here with this aquatic foraging songbird, um, it's really, you know, getting a benefit um, and a significant component of the nutrients it's consuming are not coming from the stream, they're ultimately coming from the ocean. So this is looking at the carbon. Um, and so this is a, a, a little more complex, but the same, same graph here, essentially, this the long-term average for always access to salmon is the dotted line. The, sa the salmon color is the birds that experience the, re you know, the, the dam removal. The gray is the birds that never had access. Um, and so you can see that the pattern here, and then where we see a difference here, you can see is not in the breeding season after the dam removal, but in the non-breeding season. And so if you think back to when I talked about originally the stable isotopes, there was that direct pathway and the indirect pathway. So the indirect pathway, remember, we only expect nitrogen to be elevated. So that's the fertilizer effect. And it looks like in the breeding season, that's what was happening in the Elwha. So the, the birds in the breeding season were getting that fertilizer effect of indirect nitrogen coming up through the food web. In the non-breeding season though, their carbon was also elevated. And that's an indication of that direct pathway. So they're consuming tissues grown in the marine environment, whether that be eggs or salmon carcasses or insects that are your aquatic invertebrates that are feeding on salmon carcasses. Um, what we really think it is, though, is summed up in this photo uh, that taken by Florian Grainer. Um, if you can't tell, this is a dipper with its head below the water. So you're looking underwater here. And in its bill there is a nice big salmon egg. And I talked to some of the biologists with the Elwha, um, you know, when that when fish were spawning in the tributaries, um, and they said they were watching dippers just following spawning salmon, gobbling up eggs behind them. So the non-breeding season is when the largest salmon runs are happening. Um, there are not as many runs happening during the breeding season. So that would kind of explain, I think in the breeding season, the big effect is them consuming fry. Um, so that's how they're getting that indirect pathway that fry are benefiting from the fertilizer effect and then dipper eating the fry. But in the non-breeding season, they're consuming eggs a lot. And so they're getting more of that direct um, supplement of, of the marine nutrients. So just to sum it up, um, essentially you wind up, when you obstruct salmon and cut salmon off, or if salmon are cut off naturally as well, you kind of wind up with two, what we would call life histories, two divergent life histories of dippers. Below dams or below obstructions, 
you have dippers that survive longer, they don't migrate, and they're much more likely to produce dump two broods in a breeding season. For dippers that are in areas without salmon, they tend to be more migratory, they don't live as long, and they are not going to produce as many young in a year. Um, so definitely a benefit to being a bird present with salmon present. Um, so it is, again, important to look at those numerical responses of birds, but we think our study really showed, you know, at that individual level, you know, how, how marine derived nutrients are affecting individuals and then how that ultimately must be affecting populations. Um, and the other thing is just how fast these ecosystems can respond. If there's anything the Elwha to me is a story of, it's a story of environmental resilience. That for as long as those dams were present, a hundred years, which granted in you know the timescales of ecosystems is, is pretty small, but in, when we think about human lifetimes, pretty long time. But as much as that river was impacted, the benefits were seen almost immediately. So, you know, as much as we can negatively impact ecosystems, many of these ecosystems are very resilient and taking the effort and the time and the resources to restore them can have huge benefits almost immediately. Okay, so that's all I brought for today. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions if uh, you have them. Yeah, thanks so much, Chris. That was really fascinating. Um, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the chat um, or um, unmute yourself if you'd like. I don't see any questions in the chat currently. Um, I've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, when you were doing the, the surveys, um, did you notice if there was more territories or more dense territories below the dams versus above the dams, or was it kind of equal spacing? Yeah, so that that's the interesting thing. You know, it it, it varies in both both contexts. Like I said, like there are certain areas that have a lot of birds, and then you'll get areas where they're more spread out. So like confluences, like that area of the sole duck where the north and south forks come and join with the main stem, there are like four territories in pretty close um pretty close together um the the thing is is that they're they're pretty limited by nest sites and so they have very specific needs for nests and it's why i think they're so willing to use bridges is you know it's kind of like a nest box population where you know they they if you add nest infrastructure they will increase their numbers um and so because of that, and because they're really territorial in the breeding season, we didn't, we see kind of similar densities in both areas. And it's really that they, they're excluding birds from a territory because they really need the limited number of nest sites they have. Um, so it, I think the, the nutrients doesn't have as much of an impact on density for dippers as nest, a, a, a potential nest sites has. Um, so it's more the impact is on the quality of those territories um, in terms of the, the food resources, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense for sure. A um, couple of questions have come in. Um, do you know what the, the major threats are to dippers? Um, well, what the biggest one is water quality. Um, so, you know, any sort of environmental pollutants, agrochemicals, pesticides, um, any of those sorts of things, uh, uh, you know, any acidification, anything that is going to impact aquatic invertebrates is is going to impact dipper populations. Um, so that's where the greatest impact is. And it's it's why they're such good environmental indicators, because they're so sensitive to water quality. Um, so so places where there are a lot of those inputs of chemicals, you know, uh, environmental toxins and things like that, or mercury, um, any sort of those, those sorts of things are going to be the biggest threats. Um, and, and, you know, anything that impacts the flow of rivers, you know, so if you build a dam and you create a reservoir, it's not dipper habitat anymore. Um, there's a kind of a follow-up question to that. Um, 
um, how would climate change impact them? Well, the the I mean the the biggest thing is is uh, drought and and the loss of the the sources of a lot of these rivers and in, in that many of them are fed by glaciers. Um, so increasing temperatures impacting, you know, the sources of the water and, you know, where rainfall is involved. You know, if you if you have more drought like conditions or less predictable conditions, um, that's certainly going to impact fish populations, which is then going to impact the rest of the food web. Um, so off the top of my head, that's 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 the biggest the biggest one. I mean, they they need they're reliant on water and and water dynamics are going to be heavily impacted with climate change. Um, have you noticed um, any other species, um, whether it's animal or plant, um, that are impacted by salmon presence like the dippers are? So not not so much in in the Elwha. There's been a lot of work on marine nutrients in Alaska, um, and that's where that the the study I mentioned early on in bear comes from. Um, there's been some work in other songbird species. Um, and so, yes, there, there, there is that. We did not find much. We did do some work on, uh, it was like warbling vireo and song sparrow, um, just two birds that are, you know, not, not using the water in the way the dippers are, but are in the neighboring forest along those streams. And we didn't really find any patterns of them receiving marine nutrients, but that has been found, like the study I mentioned in, um, in the Pacific Wrens uh, and in other species in Alaska and British Columbia. The difference being you don't have brown bear in the Olympics and brown bear become this vector for salmon getting into those riparian forests. They're, they're, they're pulling salmon over into the forest. They're pooping around there and everything. And so they act as this way that the nutrients can penetrate more into the terrestrial ecosystem. Um, so we did look for that some in those those other songbird species, but um, at least along along the Elwha and in, in the Olympics, we didn't we didn't find much. Um, let's see. Are you or anyone studying the changes with the Klamath Dam removal? Yes, I know. Um, I I don't know specific projects now. My former master's advisor, I did my master's at Humboldt State University in Northern California. Um, and Matt Johnson, who was my advisor, I know he's been involved um getting some some projects going. Um, but other than that, I I, I don't know of specific projects, uh, but he's one person I talked to um just to kind of share some of my experiences from the Elwha with him because I know he was planning to get some work going there. Um, and he's done a lot of work with the, tr the tribal communities there as well. Um, but yeah, other than that, I, I don't know specific specific projects going on offhand. Um, the big thing is that just getting the data now, the, the pre-removal data is so key so you can track those responses. So I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of folks working on that. Let's see. Um... Uh, this question is, what about dams created by beavers um, slowing flow or creating an impediment to salmon getting up river? Um, this is occurring on a local river in the Seattle area. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, any of these situations can can have impacts. And, you know, so dams aren't the only reason, like, you know, several, the, several of those territories I was working on, you know, they're, they're naturally, um, naturally free of salmon. Um, I don't know, are, are dippers, Nate, are, are beaver native there? Or are they introduced? I'm, I'm not positive. I'm not from here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause I know like in the Sierra Nevada, they were introduced, um, but I'm not sure about up there, but yeah, they, they, they can certainly have an impact. I mean, beavers they 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 call me ecological engineers for a reason um so it, it it could potentially have an impact and it's you know it's not only what they have on the dippers the dippers we were really looking at as kind of a a bellwether for what's going on in that larger aquatic food web um so if you're if if they are creating the dams or impacting flow and they are going to be cutting off those nutrients from from higher up the watershed 
Yeah. Here's a nice, uh, a nice non-scientific question. Uh, uh, I've only heard a, a dipper sing once. It was lovely. Did you get to hear them often? A lot. Yes. I mean, I, I mean, it, I, it, it was like the greatest opportunity. I, when I was coming out of my master's, I was pitching a dipper project all over the place for my PhD. <clears throat> and I wound up doing my PhD on migratory warblers in Jamaica, which was amazing. And I always wanted to go back to dippers. And my advisor, Pete, he was also my PhD advisor, Pete Mara. You know, he, uh, he had started this dipper project, but I wasn't done yet. So he had somebody else working on it. And lucky for me, that person quit. And so I got a call in Jamaica. Hey, do you want to do your postdoc on dippers? And it was like the, the greatest phone call ever. And so, yeah, I mean, I, that's that's all I did. I spent, you know, I forget how many seasons, you know, better part of three years in the fall and the spring, just chasing these birds all over. Um, and yeah, so they their singing is great. They love good acoustics. Sometimes I think it's the reason they like bridges too, is because their their song really echoes well in that that chamber. Um, but but yeah, they're they're and it's when I come back out west, it's like always I'm always listening for them whenever I'm along a river. Um, it's just I'm I'm really attuned to that, both their songs and the call, like their flight calls and everything. Yeah, I don't think I've ever heard one actually. Um yeah, that sounds very envious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then I have a question is, do we have dippers in coastal Snohomish County and how are they doing? Um, we do have dippers in Snohomish County. Um, I honestly don't hear much about them. Um, it's not a species that gets a lot of attention. So I, I don't know if they're, if we know what their trends are in, in this county, um, but we do have them. Um, so yeah, if, if anybody has more information than that, feel free to, to chime in. But uh, yeah, it's, that's one of the things that intrigued me about your presentation is you don't hear about dippers very often. Yeah, I know. And if you, the, an interesting thing um, down in, I think in Ashland, Oregon, there was a group, I forget if it was the local Audubon chapter or another nonprofit, but they actually designed dipper nest boxes and started putting them up in culverts and they were really successful with them. So it, it's one thing if you do feel like you, you have the right habitat, but they're not there for some reason, it's often because there's not a good nest site. Um, so if you can create a nest site, it, it could be a way to potentially recruit them um, to an area. I think that's all the questions I see in the chat. Um, so yeah. Um, Really great presentation. Thanks so much for, for joining us late on your Friday night. <laughs> no problem. My pleasure. And yeah, uh, if anybody thinks of any questions, feel free to, to email them to me and I'll 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 see if Chris can answer them for you. Um but yeah, thanks so much, Chris, and I hope you all have a great rest of your weekend. Great, thank you.